It's the George Michael Sports Machine at 6.40 this evening. The AFN Evening News is next. This is Northern Germany's community update for Monday, December 16th. From the power station, AFN Bremerhaven. Bremerhaven's CPO's next orientation session for family member employees nearing the end of their overseas assignment is tomorrow at noon in the Bremerhaven Education Center. Join in the tradition and celebration of a German Christmas with the German American Contact Club. The next meeting is tomorrow evening at 8 at the Balkan Grill in Osterholt, Starnbeck. Join the Osterholt Protestant Women of the Chapel for some good old-fashioned Christmas caroling tomorrow evening. Meet at the second AD Chapel at 7 and dress warmly. And also let your child's imagination loose at the Clay Library's Children's Christmas Story Hour, Wednesday morning from 10.30 till 11.30. I'm Air Force Sergeant Joanne Vergun. That's Northern Germany's Community Update for Monday, December 16th. In Northern Germany, the news you need, the music you want, is on the power station, AFN Bremerhaven. From our studios in Frankfurt, Germany, this is the AFN Evening News. Good evening. The Army has closed a chapter on Desert Storm. The Defense Department says the last soldiers in Kuwait should arrive home in time for Christmas. Now, the last USERA soldiers in the task force arrived in Germany last week. A spokesman says USERA soldiers, soldiers remain on duty in both Saudi Arabia and Turkey. The chapters continue to be written, however, in a unified Germany. Chancellor Helmut Kohl opened the annual CDU conference in the former East German city of Dresden. Kohl warned his fellow West Germans not to show arrogance when dealing with their beleaguered colleagues in the East. Kohl is seeking to ease tensions between the East and West factions of the CDU over economic depression in the East. When the German army, the Bundeswehr, took over the troops and facilities of the East German army in October of last year, it inherited many rundown facilities and some serious environmental problems. Gary Bautel reports work is already underway to improve conditions in the new Territorial Command East. Typical is this caserne in Brandenburg, which was formerly the home of a Nationale Volksarmee armored unit. The NVA spent most of its money in weapon systems and very little on quality of life for its soldiers. Renovation of the facilities became the first priority when the Bundeswehr took over. Since the beginning of the year, we've been making some limited improvements to the infrastructure here. We're giving top priority to the renovations of the soldiers' quarters. In the meantime, plans have been made for new construction, and before the year is out, we'll be starting construction of a fuel station for environmental reasons. Starting next year, a new administration building will be built, followed by several other buildings. So within two years, this base will be a major construction site. The NVA was not concerned with environmental pollution, but the Bundeswehr is. Therefore, gas stations, such as this one, will be the first facilities torn down and cleaned up. In the barracks area, work is already underway. This sink area is typical of the NVA's facilities. This is one of the new washrooms. The Bundeswehr has budgeted millions for the renovation of East German Army bases, but the cleanup is expected to take many years. In Brandenburg, Gary Bautzel, AFN News. The fall of the wall and the end of the Cold War has spurned many different changes in recent months. All this week, the Eastern Republic Affairs Office will be taking a look at how events are affecting the city of Berlin. Deborah Fowler begins tonight by reporting on the new mission of the Berlin Brigade. This is Doughboy City, where the Berlin Brigade has spent countless hours over the years training to protect the city of Berlin. Although they still train here, they don't do it as often because with the fall of the wall, their mission has changed. For decades, the Berlin Brigade demonstrated U.S. resolve to maintain freedom in West Berlin. Patrolling the infamous wall put up by the Soviets in August of 1961 and drilling relentlessly in city combat tactics. Then, in November 1989, things began to change. Our orientation has uh, been redefined at that same orientation as United States Army Europe. So we have a, uh, a very broad uh, contingency orientation and we train uh, for worldwide deployment now as opposed to defense of the city of Berlin. Soldiers spend more time these days on battlefield maneuvers and team battle drills. Uh, now because of our new mission, being light infantry with our two light infantry battalions here in Berlin, uh, we're, we're looking at a deployability, being able to deploy. 
Our focus is going away from combat in cities to conventional tactics. And when I talk about that, being able to deploy in the woods, being deploy in the desert, anywhere in the world, being able to be comfortable in any environment. The German government has asked the brigade to stay in Berlin until Soviet troop withdrawal from former East Germany is complete. Until they leave, the Berlin Brigade will train to fight on any battlefield, anywhere. In Berlin, Deborah Fowler reporting for AFN News. Dodds has decided to scrap plans for charging non-command sponsored soldiers tuition for their children to attend schools overseas. Now, the tuition plan was scheduled to begin in January and charged from $74 a semester for kindergarten students up to $162 a semester for grade high school. No reason for canceling the program was given in the directive issued by Dodd's director, John Strempel. Many people are saying the 90s will be the decade of the environment as nations deal with cleaning up past mistakes in order to make the world a safer and cleaner place to live. Air Force Sergeant George Jones reports the United, States to, the United States Department of Defense is well aware of environmental issues and they're doing something about it. The Defense Department maintains installations on 25 million acres of land worldwide, including deserts, mountains, and everything in between. That gives DOD one of the largest environmental missions in the world. Defense Secretary Dick Cheney has told the services, we must be fully committed to do our part to meet the worldwide environmental challenge. But officials say enormous problems face the department. DOD must clean up hazardous and toxic waste from past activities, comply with a complex array of current federal, state, and local laws, and take action to prevent future pollution and environmental contamination. Environmental concerns have to be addressed. And they can be addressed, they can be integrated, and they be can become an essential part of the DOD's defense mission. The Defense Department has set six goals to meet the challenge, to have all installations in full compliance with environmental laws by December 1993, and the cleanup of all toxic waste sites on installations underway by the year 2000, to reduce solid waste 50% by 1997, and reduce hazardous waste 25% by 1995 to reduce the use of hazardous materials by substituting non-hazardous ones and to work closer with environmental agencies and groups through community outreach programs. Mr. Baca says that DOD is committed to being a leader in environmental stewardship. We have to help this country solve a very complicated problem, and that's an environmental problem that the world's facing. And we intend to step up to that challenge. For the most part, DOD's environmental policy applies only to stateside installations. But the department is working on an overseas policy that will allow installations to incorporate the environmental concerns of their host nations. Air Force Sergeant George Orns, the Pentagon. Well, what can you say about the weather other than it's downright cold there, Sergeant Robert Rios? What can we expect for weather this week now? Well, Jim, actually, there's a couple of systems that are heading our way, and before it's all over with, we'll see some more rain, uh, perhaps some freezing rain, and maybe even a little more of that white stuff out there. Let's get things started. Jump over to the satellite, and you can see how skies out there look this afternoon. In fact, you can see both those waves of moisture that I mentioned earlier, one just uh, now working its way into the U.K., another much stronger one just to the west of that, both heading easterly and should begin working their way into Central Europe over the next 24 to 36 hours. This one already responsible for some uh, light rain over parts of the UK. Moving right along, let's go to the surface map. And again, these systems are coming in from the west these days, so that's kind of good news temperature-wise. The cooler air is staying confined to the north and uh, quite a bit of rain out there currently, although again, perhaps some freezing rain, if not some snow, as that system interacts with these cooler readings that are currently present over Central Europe. Speaking of temperatures, let's put the numbers on the board and you can see how readings compared at 3 p.m. today. 21 here in Frankfurt, 34 the high in Berlin, 49 in London, 47 all the way in Glasgow. Also Norway checked in at 32. Kind of cool out there today, but certainly not as cool as it was this time last week. There were a bunch of 20s out there last Monday. Moving right along, let's go to uh, take a look at the numbers here in Germany. Kind of a good contrast in conditions out there this afternoon. Sunshine a little more popular into the east. Temperatures generally in the uh, upper 20s, lower 30s range. A few more clouds out to the west, though. In fact, even some light rain at 3 p.m. being reported in uh, Belgium. Aside from that, that looks like 40. That was a high, and that was in Cologne. Let's take these numbers off, see what tomorrow's forecast map reveals, and those two systems continue, kind of merge and interact out west. Looks like most of your unsettled weather will continue over the U.K., down towards uh, the western part of Spain, perhaps even some light snow 
over uh, the northern parts of uh, Scotland. Aside from that, though, later tomorrow evening, some of that unsettled weather will begin working its way into Central Europe, so we'll see what that looks like then. And as far as the numbers go, uh, temperatures continuing in the upper 20s, mostly 30s, though, here in Central Europe, and 30s and 40s should continue out west. So let's uh, recap this and take one more look at the forecast. Cloudy, foggy weather will continue across Central Europe with an increasing chance of rain, freezing rain, possibly even some light snow over the UK. Or rather, the UK will see a return to more cloudy, windy, unsettled weather. Highs from the lower 30s to low 40s. That's my forecast. I'll see you tomorrow night. The dollar started the week on even ground today, managing to hold its own on European money markets. There were only slight changes in some of the exchange rates. And as we go to the break, let's take a look at what they are. Nothing in life comes easy, and applying for commercial credit can be, well, a laughing matter. But now, APHIS Europe can help you get the credit you need to help you buy the things you want. How about a television? Or a computer? Or a new car? Yes, and even a new home. Honey, I'm glad I remembered to get my credit reference report before we rotated back to the States. Our future does look bright with DPP credit backing us. Let your good DPP credit record help you. The single soldier program in Usurer is designed to improve the lives of the soldiers in the barracks. Soldiers in the barracks are now being treated like their counterparts who live off post. Charlie Gill reports on how the program is being received by soldiers in Monheim. Private Tanya Townsell lives on the third floor at Mannheim's Taylor Barracks. She decorates her room the way she sees fit, and she and her roommate have visitors without checking them through with charge of quarters. Hello. It's a pretty good deal these yeah. days. Well, I was thinking about going downtown. And Townsell is quick to tell you this oh, equal treatment right. initiative That's is something right. she's been waiting for. Okay. This whole program is heading in the direction it needs to be heading in. It needs to treat soldiers like we are growing up, whereas somebody who may be two years younger than me and lives off post gets to be treated more maturely than I do. Because they're married. That's right, which may not be so. The changes can be seen from day rooms to barracks rooms. Each commander implements changes as he sees fit and with the budget constraints. But perhaps more importantly, the chain of command is giving soldiers more control over their private lives. There are no more surprise barracks details or room inspections just because that's the way it's always been. And single soldiers will tell you they're satisfied the commanders recognize them now as individuals. I like the way that things are changing because now the responsibility falls upon the soldier. There's no more mass punishment the way it was before. This equal treatment initiative is user wide, and as with any new program, there are glitches to be worked out. The soldiers mostly agree. It's a step in the right direction. In Mannheim, with the user of Public Affairs Office, Charlie Gill for AFN News. A major army element is leaving Europe due to the drawdown, the 3rd Armored Division. Now, most of the soldiers have already left, and there are fewer than 600 soldiers left in the division. But many of the civilians are still with the unit, and they were recognized for their hard work at an appreciation luncheon. The division's commander, Major General Jerry Rutherford, presented the civilians with awards for achievement and excellence, applauding the many long hours spent supporting the mission of the 3rd Armored Division in Europe. The latest in technology goes hand in hand when it comes to maintaining equipment in any branch of the service. Reporting from Bitburg Air Base, Sergeant Scott Williams shows us how the Air Force is using advanced technology to evaluate and maintain jet engines. Maintenance of jet engines has never been easy. Hundreds of fan blades can be damaged by birds, rocks, or anything else sucked into a jet intake. Thousands of man hours are spent troubleshooting these engines, a process that is tedious and time consuming. Bitburg is the only USAFE Air Base unit using video equipment to reduce maintenance time. Something called a video borescope cuts the three-hour two-man job in half. 
The procedure is similar to arthroscopic surgery. A tiny camera inserted in the engine projects a picture on the monitor and the image is then recorded. The thing that I like about it the most is the fact that you can record it and any damage that's found, it can be viewed by various people you know, later on. It's, it's already a it's recorded history. The versatile system can also send a facsimile to any unit that might need to view the damage in a hurry. With pinpoint accuracy, jet engine damage can now be seen instead of just described at Bitburg Air Base. I'm Sergeant Scott Williams reporting. Making sure the holiday mail gets to its destination on time is a massive undertaking each year for Postal Group Europe. Specialist Brooke Perkins visited the Userer Mail Processing Facility at Offenbach to see how this year's mail crunch is stacking up. Between now and mid-January, more than 200,000 pounds of mail daily will come through the Offenbach facility, nearly double the usual volume. Uh, the mail that we're going to have running through here during the Christmas season, we figure that we will bring in, have brought in from CONUS about 10 million pounds that we will be sending back to CONUS from the, uh, the residents here in, uh, in Usera are about 9 million pounds. Processing these mountains of mail are 67 soldiers from the 228th Postal Company and 34 civilian workers. Assisted by augmentees from other communities, teams maintain around-the-clock operations, and St. Nick's elves have nothing on this group when it comes to meeting holiday deadlines. Uh, our staff, our um, soldiers here, they know that the mission requires the mail to get out, and that's when they come into work, they expect uh, that to happen, you know, so there's no as if or buts about it. The mail is going to be worked, it's going to get out, it's going to come in, and it's going to get to where it's going. A majority of the inbound use of mail is processed here at Offenbach. On a day uh, here at this time of year, we'll probably handle about 21 vans, mail vans will come to us. We'll process here, unload the vans, and the vans will weigh any, uh, carry a volume of anywhere from 10,000 pounds of mail up to 16,000 pounds of mail, depending on the size of the van. Gets offloaded, puts on a, put on a conveyor belt, it'll get uh, sorted here to come into one of the respective APOs. Then when it's set to be moved out, it gets pulled out of that bin, put back on a truck and sent, we call it downrange, but it'll get sent to the APO of record and they will sub-break it down. Ultimately, either a consolidated mail room will get it or a unit mail clerk will pick it up and then hand it out to individuals. A laborious process, adds Colonel Gibson, but the holiday goal has been set at Postal Group Europe and Santa's sleigh won't be the only empty place come Christmas morning. We guarantee to the people in Userar that as of Christmas, Christmas Day, there will be no U.S. Army mail on the ground addressed to anybody. It will have been delivered sometime Christmas Eve. In Offenbach, Specialist Brooke Perkins, AFN News. Germany is, of course, well known for the many different Christmas markets around the country this time of year. Just about every city or village has one running or is planning to hold a market before Christmas Day arrives. Private Larry Croucher took a camera to Frankfurt's Christmas market and shows us how the people of Frankfurt are enjoying the season. The streets of downtown Frankfurt are a bit more crowded this time of the year. The reason? Well, tis the season for the annual Frankfurt Christmas market. The market, located along Frankfurt's Romer Platz, offers Christmas shopping enthusiasts the opportunity to shop for that special Christmas gift. The majority of the crafts for sale here are handmade, even the toys for the children. Some visitors enjoy the wide variety of food available. For those trying to keep warm, a glass of blue vine or the local favorite apple vine usually does the trick. Why, even St. Nicholas himself was on hand, greeting children of all ages spending a day at the market. It's a lot of fun. We just got here today. It's the first time here at this one today, um, but it's festive. It's, it's Christmas. I mean, uh -huh. I like seeing the people. You know, they got the glue vine out here, and it's good stuff. It's um, just a lot of fun. You can see the, all the different the, the customs things that they do for Germans that that we don't have in the States. They got the little wooden figures for the Christmas trees and, and what they mean. The festive atmosphere in the market continues on throughout the day and into the night. As the temperatures drop, the colorful Christmas lights seem to warm things up, as well as raise spirits. Spirits that will hopefully last through the holiday season. From the Frankfurt Christmas Market, I'm PFC Larry Croucher, AFN News. And don't forget, there's only nine more shopping days to go before Christmas to pick up those last-minute presents. George Michael is up next. Take care. Have yourselves a good one, everybody.